Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again, God, for the opportunity here tonight to study your word. To Lord, I think look at a, a pretty amazing section of scripture as we hear your heart calling out to the nation of Israel in a time where, uh, kind of as Rob prayed earlier, where they had kind of given up. Life had gotten hard. The fire went out. They're, being drift, they're drifting off. They're going into other things. And just to hear your heart calling out to them, I know you have that same heart for us. So God, if life has gotten in our way and things have interrupted our relationship with you and, and even quenched it uh, to some degree, God, I pray that as we hear you tonight that that would be rekindled in our hearts and, and in our lives. And, and God, we, uh, again, just want you to use us. What an opportunity we have, especially in the next few days as uh, the world will, will recognize uh, a, a holiday that some thinks about bunnies, but Lord, we know it's about the resurrection, and I pray, God, again, that uh, we would be light for you at this time, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we come out of a section, if you were with us last time, Isaiah was kind of talking about the sin of the people and, and uh, uh, you know, talking to them about that. Now, listen, now we hit kind of an interesting part to me where God is demonstrating who he is. And I just want to read, I want to read all of the, the uh, places where he's got the personal pronoun I. This is God speaking, and I just kind of took them all out of these two chapters. But listen to this and tell me God's not great. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. I will be with you when you pass through the waters. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave you Egypt for your ransom. I have loved you. I will give I will give men for you. I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, the west, the north, and the south. I have created you for my glory. I have formed I have formed him. I have made him. I have chosen my servant. I am before before I am he before me there was no god formed I even I am the lord I have declared and saved I have proclaimed I am god I am before the day was I work who can reverse it I will send to Babylon I am the lord your holy one the creator of Israel your king I will do a new thing I will make a road in the wilderness <clears throat> I give waters in the wilderness and uh, rivers in the desert. I have formed for myself a people. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings. I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions. I will not remember your sins. I will profane the princes of the sanctuary, and I will give Jacob to the curse. Man, that is a lot of stuff, right? And here's what God is revealing to him, that he's God. They had lost sight of that. You've got you to remember, Isaiah's speaking to a generation. He's letting them know, and, and again, he's kind of looking to the future where they're going to be in Babylon. God's going to deliver them. But as for right now, here's what they're doing. They're a people who are drifting away, and they're beginning to worship idols, and they're beginning to go after other gods. So in this section, God is revealing to them in all of those pronouns, I. He's letting them know, this is who I am, and check this out, then why are you running after those other gods? And it's kind of the same thing today, right? Here's what we know, the things that allure us and kind of pull us away, those are the things that can get us in serious trouble, and God so wants to protect us, but even greater than that, he wants us to worship him for who he is. He's God. I was reading, I think it was a, a, a clip out of some writings of C.S. Lewis today, and, 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 uh, or it might have been Robert Murray McShane. I was reading kind of stuff from both of them. And th there's this whole dilemma, I think, and it was in their generation, McShane way before C.S. Lewis, and C.S. Lewis in our generation, where we forget that we need to worship God because he's God, for nothing else. And we lose sight of that, and we... Sometimes, if we're really honest, we worship him for what we can get from him. And that's what Israel had begun to do. And then they realized, man, some of these idols were doing some things for them. So now God, instead of like, to me, instead of really rebuking them, here's what he says. You want to go after those idols? Fine. 
but I'm going to show you something so much better than those idols. I'm going to make you look at those idols and go, what was I thinking? So check it out here. In verse 43, he says, but now, thus says the Lord. So again, the contrast is the, the couple chapters before where they were sinning and doing stuff. So now, but now, says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow uh, you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Now here's what I think the Lord's doing. He's talking about something in the future, but he's almost talking about some history with them, isn't he? When you pass through the, the waters, remember when they passed through the Red Sea, Right? And God was with them. When they passed through the river, when they crossed the Jordan, he was there. And maybe even an allusion to the, to the three boys in the fire, right? When you go through the fire, I'm with you. Here's what God said. If I was there then, what do you think I'm going to be now? God is faithful, and he's there with them. So I, I kind of read that, and I think here's God crying out to a people who are pushing him away. That's our God. I get upset when people kind of, you know, portray our God as somebody who, uh, you know, well, if you're going to go that way, then I'm mad at you, and I'm going to punish you, and I'm going to get on you. That's not our God. Man, he's always reaching out to us and wanting to embrace us. And check this out. Then that's a God worthy of worship, isn't he? So he goes on, listen, verse 3, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Here's what's going on. He's prophesying earlier, and at the end of this section we're reading tonight, he's going to talk about Cyrus. He gave Babylon and Ethiopia and Seba to Cyrus as a ransom, in other words, or I'm sorry, Egypt, to get rid of them so Cyrus could let Israel go back. So he's kind of talking about that. And then verse 5, Fear not, for I, am, uh, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Woo! God is going to bring everybody. Now, I, I think you might talk about that generation, but isn't it interesting in our generation? I, since I've been saved, I've been amazed to watch the people being gathered into the nation Israel. Even since I've, I've been saved, for when I first got saved, there were more Jews in New York City than there were in Israel. Not today. And they've come from all over. And some of you may remember in the late 80s, early 90s, all the Ethiopian Jews who were going back to Israel. And they were bringing them in and they were flying them and, and uh, you know, getting them back home. And listen, man, that's and here's what God says. I'm going to go all over the world and I'm going to bring you back. That's kind of cool to think about, isn't it? Here's what I'm thinking. You can't run and hide from God. You can try, but you can't run and hide. And here's the cool thing, man. He'll chase you down. And he'll get you because he loves you. And he's going to draw you in. And, and that's kind of good news, isn't it? That he loves them that much. So then, listen, bring, now here's what he's going to talk about a little bit about their idolatry. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf people who have ears. Now, I think he's talking a little bit about people who are rejecting. But I also think he's talking about these hokey idols they've made, Right? And it's going to get, he's going to get more uh, demonstrative about that. But he's talking a little bit. Bring those out. And he says, listen, verse 9. Let all the nations be gathered together and let all the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out the witness that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. Here's what God's saying. Bring out those idols. Here's what he's saying. I'm not afraid of all these false gods. Let's have a showdown. I kind of like our God, right? He kind of smack talks once in a while. He says, just bring them out here. Let's see. Let's find out who's really God. Let's see what they can predict. Let's see what they can tell you about the past. And let's see what happens. And, and listen, it's, it's kind of cool, right? He says, and let them do that, verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Check this out. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Woo! Is that good? 
man, see, so you kind of you get to reading in Isaiah and you go through all this stuff and then you, you get to these places and you're going, yes. You know, sometimes people say there's many ways to heaven. In some ways, uh, there, there's not many ways to heaven. There's many roads to God, no doubt, because some of it's judgment. But, you know, listen, Jesus is not one of the ways. He's not even the best way. He's the only way. That's what he's saying here. The only way. And it, you know, it upsets me when people say, man, you Christians are so narrow-minded. Well, in a sense, we are. And I've talked about it before. Listen, when I'm on an airplane, I want a pilot who's really narrow-minded. I don't want a pilot that's going to go, eh, any old runway. What does it matter? Let's just pick one and land. I want him to be very narrow-minded and, you know, conservative and, and, you know, very decisive and that sort of thing. Well, the saying, listen, we know that the only way to heaven is Jesus. And we want to share that with people. And I, I pray that we learn how to share that without coming across as condescending, without coming across as self-righteous, but coming across like I read in this section where God is like almost pleading with the people, come on, come on, I'm God. Why are you worshiping these other, you know, idols and stuff? So again, there's no other. He's the only one. And then he says this in verse 12, I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you, therefore you were my witness, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there's no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work and who will reverse it. Check this out, man. No one can get you out of God's hand. That's good news, I think. You know, I like the idea that God's got that kind of grip on me because, you know, sometimes people say, just hold on to God. I don't know about you guys, but my grip gets a little loose sometimes. I get a little tired. I get a little worn out. My God's not going to let go. Is that good news, man? Uh, no one can deliver you out of my hand. And here's what I think he's also saying. You can try what you want, but you're not going to mess up my plan. God's going to see it all the way through the end, and people can do what you want. Verse 14, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon, and I will bring them down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth a, the chariot and the horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together, they shall not rise, they are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Once again, those countries that have come against Israel, they're going to disappear. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, now it shall bring forth, and shall you uh, not know it. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. So again, God just declaring that he's going to bring them out. Again, remember, Isaiah is talking to people who are in Babylon. God's going to get them out. And listen, God can take them through the wilderness. He's done it before, right? He can take them through hard times. He can take them through areas where they seem lost. Do you ever wander around and think you're lost? Well, guys do all the time, but you know, you kind of, but not, not that way. But how about spiritually a little bit? You kind of get like out of sync and stuff and, and going. And you know, here's what I find I tend to do that when I'm not praying, I'm not reading my Bible, and I'm not hanging out with believers. And I start getting kind of all, all whacked out and I, and I start drifting. And listen, that's what Israel is doing and God keeps saying, don't you remember who I am? I'm the one that I can, I can find your way no matter where you're. He's better than any GPS stuff we got, right? He can kind of get us going, get us back on track. So he lays that out. But then check this out because see, Israel was in that place, like I said, not only were they worshiping idols, but when they worshiped him, they weren't into it. Listen to what he says, verse 22. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. 
You have not brought me, or you have brought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins, and you have wearied me with your iniquities. Now, if you remember in Chronicles, we're reading at one point, they brought 120,000 sheep. But here's what God says. You've made it a burden for you. You've wearied yourself with it. You've not come to worship me. You've come to fulfill some obligation. And you know, sometimes we kind of do that, don't we? Instead of coming to worship God, we worship to get, or we worship out of some obligation. And worship needs to be about him and him only and exalting him. And I'm not just talking about the time where we're singing. Our whole gathering time is a time of worship. And it needs to be, listen, it needs to be where we're exalting the Lord. And he says, man, when you get weary in worship is when you're in trouble. Is when you need to realize spiritually you're in trouble because you're making it a work and you're making it something that's bringing you down. And God never intended for worship to be that Old Testament or New Testament. He never intended them to come, you know, dragging a, a bull in there going, oh, I'm going to bring another bull. I'm going to believe this. I hate this. And listen, he says, no, your heart is supposed to come for me. And so God sees that. And then he says, listen, now he goes, you are wearying me with all of your sin. I, even I, verse 25 am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Woo! See, God says, I'm worried with your sins. And what does he turn around and say? Don't worry, I'll blot them out. I love that idea. I love the idea that God blots our sins out, he takes care of them, and that he's not going to remember. I, re I remember when I was first saved. When I was first saved, I, I've shared with you guys, I got real legalistic and I was reading, reading and listening to legalistic teachers. And I remember one guy in particular was teaching about the fact that there is no way that God has forgiven our present. He's forgiven our past sins, but he hasn't forgiven our present sins or our future sins. We still have to deal with those. And I'll never forget that. He said, it's like you're holding up a cardboard Jesus and hiding behind him. And you know, I'm kind of thinking, that's a good idea, right? I'm kind of thinking, I would like God to see Jesus instead of me. And you know what? As I've grown with the Lord, I need a bigger cardboard Jesus. You know, listen, the Bible teaches clearly He has forgiven our past sins, our current sins, and our future sins. That shit, and then people go, well, now you're telling people to go sin. No way. Man, if that makes you sin, something is not right in your heart. That should make you not sin, Right? And so listen, man, he's, here's what he's telling them. He says, you guys, I blotted it all out. Verse 26, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. So here's what God's saying. I'm going to forget all that unless you want to go to court, right? Want to go to court? I'll go to court with you. And he says, listen, your first father sinned and your me uh, mediators have transgressed me. I think he's talking about, listen, I don't think he's talking about Adam. I think he's talking about Abraham. I think he's talking about Moses. I think he's talking about all the priests who are there. All those guys transgressed. Therefore, I will profane the prince of the sanctuary and I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to the reproaches. Here's what God's saying. If you insist on doing that, I'm going to let you go. And God lets them go into Babylon. We've, I've said before, listen, we're going to read in Kings and Chronicles whenever we get back in there. They go into captivity because they would not stop worshiping idols. And God says, okay, if you want to worship idols, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put you in a nation that worships idols like crazy. And you're going to go and you're going to get full of it. I, I've noticed where sometimes we ask God and we ask God, sometimes we ask Him for things that are stupid, right? Sometimes we even ask Him if we can sin. We do. So we do. We don't call it that, but we got this whole idea. I want to go do this. God, can I please do this? Can I please do this? And then sometimes He goes, okay, go do it. And then sometimes he says, I want you to do it so much that you get sick of it. Like, I'm going to rub your face in it, right? And just go do it and do it and do it and do it. And then, you know, it's kind of like sometimes when you're a kid and, you know, you love ice cream or something, and your parents go, okay, now you're going to eat a gallon of it, you know, until you get sick. And God says, listen, I'm going to let you do this till it makes you, you know, so sick 
that you're going to get away from it. Yet, you got to go to chapter 44. Yet hear me now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I've chosen. So he says, you want to go that direction, I'll let you. Yet, you got to hear me. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Yeshurun, who, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty." And floods on the dry ground, and I will pour out my spirit, or pour my spirit on your descendants, and my blessing on your offspring. Wow. When was the last time you were really thirsty for God? I mean, thirsty for God. Lately, something's going on in my body that I don't know what's happening. I don't know what, what's causing it, but it, like it. Two in the morning, I wake up and my entire mouth is dry, just completely dried out. I mean, not just barely. I mean, completely dried out. And it's like my tongue is stuck and I'm, I got to go get a drink, get some water in there to re-lubricate it. And I think, I want to have that for God. I want to get that dried out and that parched. I don't know what's, what's causing that. That's, I don't, I don't want to go through that much longer, but... I want that for the Lord. When was the last time? And I think it was McShane that was talking about people have lost a thirst for the things of God. We're not thirsty for them. In other words, man, you show up and you begin worship and you begin worship in song and you begin worship in the word and you just feel quenched and you feel satisfied. That's what he's talking about here. As he says, listen, man, I'm going to pour rivers on you. You're going to be so quenched, it's going to be crazy. And then I'm going to pour out my spirit. And again, I think of, you know, Pentecost and even in our own lives. And then verse 4, then they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water course. And one will say, here's what I love. One will say, I'm the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's. And name himself, or, and name himself by the name of Israel. Listen, I kind of get the idea. Listen, these guys are springing up, and they're going, "Yes, I belong to the Lord." And another one gets a tattoo that says Israel, and another one gets that's I think what he's saying. And listen, man, he start marking it, and they're like, "I belong to the Lord," and they're excited about it. And listen, it's not like, "Yeah, let's go to church and let's do this thing." No, they're listen, they're quenched. It's kind of like when I get up in the middle of the night, stumble in the kitchen and get that water, and finally, man, I can, I can feel things in my mouth again, and I'm going, oh, that feels better. Man, I want, I, want, I want the Word of God to do that in my life. I want His presence to do that. So listen, he lays all that out, and then a little bit more about Israel. Then we're going to talk about idols for a minute. Verse, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am first and I am last. Beside me there is no God. Are you kind of getting the idea that there's only one God through this? Are you kind of getting the idea that God, you know, is pretty much honoring and glorifying Himself through this? Which, by the way, that's bad when we do it. It's good when God does it. But listen, I'm the first and the last. Doesn't Jesus say that same thing in the first chapter of Revelation? I'm the old Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Last time I checked, there can only be one first and there can only be one last. You can't have I'm the first first and I'm the last last. Hmm. I believe when we're reading Revelation, Jesus is declaring that he's the God and the same God of Isaiah, right? That he is that. And listen, man, and there's no other one beside me. You can't go the other way. Verse 7, who can proclaim as I do? Whoever, who has ever given prophecies like the Lord our God? What is there, like, I think it's 700 prophecies about Christ that have all been fulfilled. Pretty crazy. And then he says, let him declare, here's what God's doing, calling out the idols again. Who can proclaim as I do? Let him declare it and set it in order for me. I want to see it. And since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Let them show everybody. Let them show them to the ancients. Let them know everybody what's doing. And they says, do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time, from the ancient time, and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Now, 
He's going to talk about idolatry. This is where it gets crazy. Listen, so God lays out who he is, everything he's done, the creation, everything. And then he says this, verse 9, those who make an image, all of them are useless. You might underline that. Listen, I, I think that would be enough. And you've got to remember Hebrew poetry, right? Hebrew poetry, you know, sometimes they build on it. So from the first part of verse 9, he's just going to build on that over and over and over and show how useless they really are. He's going to tell us a lot of different ways, but he's building on it, trying to get it across, because here's what God knows. He can't just say something to us and we accept it. He's going to say it like a hundred different ways, just like sometimes we do with our kids, right? And sometimes our kids go, why, why? Why? You, got, you get them in that certain age where they're, you know, five, six. They're, hey, don't do that. Why? Well, because you're going to get hurt if you do it. Why? Well, because here's the reaction if you do that. Why? Right? So that's kind of what we do with God. So he's just like giving us all the, all the different scenarios. So listen, those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses, they neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? Here's what God's saying. Why would you do that? It's like the dumbest thing in the world. I, I always am fascinated when I travel around and see people who are really into idolatry today not i mean we have our our idols but very few of us make idols where we we do things but when i travel around and i see people i'm thinking you just made that thing and if you made that thing that makes you greater than that thing why are you now worshiping it because you made it you're stupid you know and and it's uh, you're not processing things and that's what god's saying so listen he says he says listen who would form this and that's going to profit him nothing verse 11 Surely all his companions would be ashamed. Here's what God's saying. Isn't there somebody that's going to step up and say, what on earth are we doing, right? Why are we doing these things? So listen, surely all his companions and the workmen, they're mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them all stand up, yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with his tongs works in works one in the coals so he fashions it with hammers and he works it with the strength of his arms even so he is hungry and his strength fails and he drinks no water in his faint you get the idea then this guy's working like crazy making this god sets it up and it doesn't do him any good right the craftsman who stretches out his rule, this is the other one. That was, so again, just using different illustrations, whether you're a blacksmith, now this is a carpenter, I guess, stretches out his rule. He marks out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass. He makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it re may remain in his house. He cuts down cedars for himself, and he takes cypress and the oak, and he secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. And he plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn. For he will take some of it and warm himself. And yes, he kindles it, and he bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships him, or it. And he makes it a carved image, and he falls down to it. Here's what God's saying. You get this wood... And you gather it, and you're the one, you measure it, you plane it, you take care of it. And he goes, with some of it, you light on fire and warm yourself. And with the other of it, you fall down in front of it. Are you crazy or what? Right? He burns half of it in the fire. With, with this half, he eats his meat. He roasts a roast, and he, sat, and he is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, ah, oh, I am warm. I have seen the fire. God is such a mocker. And the rest of it, he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it and prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. I mean, that, listen, God, God has a way of making things seem really, really foolish, right? He's going, what on earth are you thinking? You use it for fuel, and then you're worshiping the next thing, kind of like us in gasoline, I guess. But listen, he says, you're doing that. So listen, verse 18 these gods that you made, they do not know, nor do they understand. 
for he has shut his eyes so they cannot see and their hearts so they cannot understand. I think he's talking a little bit about the idols and a little bit about the people. And when he says, listen, he has shut their eyes, some people say, oh, God shut their eyes and God's mean. How did God shut their eyes? Listen, God didn't go and go, be blind, I don't want you to see this. How did he shut their eyes? God shut their eyes this way, by revealing himself to them. And they chose not to see and it became harder and harder and harder. That's what always disturbs me with people. You know, you see and, and you, you want them to come to the Lord. You want them to give their heart to the Lord. And you share with them. But every time you reject, you get a little bit harder, a little bit harder. And then pretty soon your eyes are shut and you can't hear. Your ears are closed off and you can't hear. So I think that's, idol- that's what idolatry does to you, no doubt. And listen, so verse 19, And no one considers his heart, nor is there knowledge, nor understanding to say, And here's what God's saying. Why don't you even have enough common sense to know I burned half of it in the fire, and yes, I also baked bread on its coals, and I have roasted meat, and I've eaten it, and I shall make the rest of it into an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Think about it, right? A block of wood. That's what you're doing. He feeds on ashes and deceived his heart. A deceived heart has turned him aside. He cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there uh, not a lie in my right hand? So here's the God lays all that out. Now remember, he's talking to the nation. Verse 21, remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you, and you are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. Here's what I, here's what I love about this. Have you noticed How many times God has declared that he formed Israel? Listen, he's formed us. He's made us. Why would he forget us? I share when I do the pottery presentation, I can go go any place and I can see the pots that I've made. Why? I've made them. I care about them. God's formed us. He's not going to forget us. He's not going to go, oh, well, sorry. I mean, I kind of liked you, but I just, like, slipped my mind. No, and I, I love that, man. He's even letting this nation know that blew it so bad. Hey, you're not going to be forgotten by me. I've blotted out, again, check it out. Here it comes again. I blotted out like a thick cloud uh, your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins return to me, for I have redeemed you. Do you hear the heart of God? Come home. Come back. Man, that's what I'm praying for Sunday, right? Let's see a whole bunch of people come home and come back, even tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and I'm reading this to you and you're going, I want to come home. Well, you don't have to wait till Sunday. You can do it here in a little bit, right? Then listen, I redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. You see what God is doing? God is doing not for the sake of Israel. He's doing it for the sake of himself. He's getting honor and glory. And listen, that would be bad if he wasn't a perfect God. And since he's a good, perfect God, him being glorified reveals to the world Here is the great God. Don't you want a piece of this, right? Don't you want to be part of this? So again, he says he does it for that. Verse 24, or or, uh, I'm sorry, verse 24. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Lord your Redeemer, the Lord your Redeemer. I like that, huh? He who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things. Here's what I love, man. Listen, listen how great this God is. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. He doesn't need any help. And yet, check this out. He knows you. And sometimes I lay awake at night thinking about that. I love to go outside and look at all the stars and think about how marvelous that is and then think the one who casts the furthest star I can see knows me. Yeah. Yeah. I made you, right? He did all of that. And then I love this. Here's some more smack talk. Verse 25, God is a God who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives the diviners mad. You know, the next time somebody's trying to do something all hokey, they get all uptight, you might tell them, I know God, and you can know God, because he's the one like doing that to you right now. 
And he's like making you crazy because you shouldn't be doing that, right? And he makes their knowledge foolishness. Who confirms the word of his servant, I think that's Isaiah letting him know, performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. Now, listen again, if he's talking to that generation that's in captivity, now this makes a lot of sense, right? So this is going forward for Isaiah. And he's letting them know, hey, you're in captivity, but you know what? Jerusalem's going to be inhabited again, although you're gone. And to Judah, you shall be built, and I will rise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your river. So here's what God's saying. There's nothing going to get in our way. And then check this out. This is kind of a preview for next Thursday. Listen, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Cyrus. This guy hasn't even been born yet. He won't get born for another maybe 150, maybe 160 years. And he's not going to do what God says here for another 200 years. And God names him by name, by name, and says, this is a guy I'm going to use to get you back to Jerusalem and to get you back to, or back to Judah and back to Jerusalem and get the temple. Listen to what he says, man. Cyrus, my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Woo! Hey, if you're sitting in Babylon under a tree and you're bummed out and you read that, you're going to punch your Shlomo next to you and you're going to say, let's get going, man, because you know what? Cyrus is coming, Right? Now, an interesting thing, Josephus says that somehow somebody got this in the hands of Cyrus. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's kind of, it doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to help God out. He's got this covered, but, but here's what I love. He names him by name 200 years before it ever happened. He says exactly what's going to happen. Now, you know, for years, and even today, there's some people who say, you know, there's two Isaiahs. Some people say there's three Isaiahs. The first Isaiah that we're reading about of all the destruction. Then there's this Isaiah, and then later on there's another Isaiah. And they wrote at different time periods. And this Isaiah wrote after the Babylonian captivity. That's what the skeptics say. Because how could you be that accurate, right? I mean, let's be fair. That's pretty crazy. Someone writing with that kind of accuracy. And so people think that. Now, here was a fascinating thing. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found the scroll of Isaiah. And there was only one scroll. There wasn't a whole bunch of different time periods. It was all together. I don't know if it's one solid scroll, but you know what I'm talking about. And it proved that there's only one Isaiah. Now, here's what's crazy. There are some people who go, nah, I don't believe it. It's like, don't confuse me with the facts because I've already made up my mind. That can't be true. It's just like, you know, Isaiah gets picked on a lot in this section and then Daniel gets picked, up, uh, picked on a lot because he's so accurate in what he prophesies, especially centuries later, that they go, there's no way they could do it. They're absolutely right. There's no way Isaiah could do this. God could. Isaiah can't. And I love this that God names him. You know, when I, when I get in this section of Isaiah, it just makes me so much stronger in my faith because here's a God, number one, who's got every right to be mad at his people, angry with them, if I were God, I would just stomp them. I'd just start over. I'd just, I'd, you know, but I'm not God, right? He's want, he wanted, remember when he wanted to get rid of them with Moses? Listen, and God's, God's wooing them. There's times where we get aggravated with one another and, and we kind of lose it and, and et cetera. God woos. Listen, we need to be a people about redemption, not pushing people away but redemption. Our God is a God of redemption all through the scriptures. He's redeeming, he's redeeming, he's redeeming. You kind of think even, even the 70 years of captivity in Babylon wasn't because God was mad. It's because God wanted them to get their fill of idolatry. You, wanna, you want idols? Then let's go do it. Let's go all the way. You know, and hey, my prayer is none of us would do that because I think there's times in our lives where we keep begging him for something. He says, okay, then go do it. Go do it and you're going to be miserable and you're going to come home. Here's the thing. I believe he's going to bring you home, but why would you want to go through the, all the muck and the mire to get home? Why don't you just stay home, right? Why would we go through that? And then also, I pray that we would 
not be people who are weary when we worship. And again, not just talking about song, but when we gather together, it wouldn't be a weary, wearisome or burdensome thing that we would come together with. Woo! God is going to do something, and all I care about is lifting up and exalting his name because I just read all these things he said to Israel, and all those things are true of Israel, and check this out, they're true of us and how blessed we are. Let's stand up and pray. Lord, we do think of this, and again, I think it's amazing of how you demonstrate who you are to, to that group, that generation. And I pray that, Lord, as we stand here as a group of people redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that, God, if any of us are in that place where we have become distant or a little bit weary, a little bit worn out with our worship and with our honoring you, I pray, Lord, that tonight you would put that thirst in us and then you would come and quench that dryness, that parchness. And I pray, God, for each one of us, Lord, that we would see you for who you are not for some, even some of us, we, we make you into our image. I pray that we could see you as the image of this one who's represented in Isaiah 43 and 44. We could understand how powerful, how awesome you are. And God, that we would understand with all of your power, all of your might, all of your strength, you redeemed us. You cared for us that much that with the power of Almighty God, you died on that cross so we could have life with you. Thank you. And God, be glorified in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.